This video is about determining the basic properties of the planets. Here is a picture that shows what the planets look like as seen from the Earth using a telescope with the same magnification. The outer planets are shown as they'd appear when at their closest distance to us. The Venus and Mercury pictures show the various phases of them. I even include dwarf planet Pluto for the Pluto lovers, though I had to cheat with this since Pluto would actually be a third of a pixel in size. Since a pixel is the smallest thing you can have in a digital picture, Pluto is a full pixel here. Again, all of these are at the same magnification. I use this picture to motivate why we need to know the distances to the planets first before we can do a comparison of, of them with each other and with the Earth. Is Venus the largest planet, or does it look big because it can get very close to us? How about Jupiter? You can measure how much material a planet has by looking at the orbital motions of moons circling it, but you need to know how big are the moon orbits. But to know how big the moon orbits are, you need to know how far away the planet is. In order to do any comparison of the planets with the Earth and with each other, you must first determine their distance from us. Distance is the first thing to determine because it then forms the basis for all the other properties. That is why finding distances in astronomy is so darn important. There are a couple of ways of measuring really large distances that are too large for any sort of tape measure or pacing out the distance. The first method is a method that has been used for literally thousands of years, triangulation, also called the surveyor's method. In the history chapter of the Astronomy Notes textbook, I describe the parallax effect of looking at something, say your thumb, with one eye and then the other eye. It will appear to shift position as you look at it with one eye and then the other eye. The farther away you hold your thumb, the, the smaller the parallax shift will be. Well, if you measure the angular shift and the baseline between your two eyes, you can determine the distance to your thumb using trigonometry. The picture shows how we use the angle tilt of the telescopes and the baseline to get the distance. We won't get into the trigonometry math. I want you to know the astronomy measurement part. What do we have to measure? Angles and the baseline. After that, it's just math to do the calculation. A modern technique that works for the rocky planets is radar. We send out a radio wave and time how long it takes it to go from the Earth to the rocky planet and back again. Since you know that radio travels at the speed of light, the round trip distance equals the speed of light times the round trip travel time. The distance to the planet is just half the round trip distance. This won't work for finding the distance to the Jovian planets or the Sun since they don't have a solid surface to reflect the radio wave, and they also produce a lot of radio energy themselves that would wash out any reflected radio waves in any case. Several hundred years ago, Copernicus was able to determine approximate distances between the planets through trigonometry. The distances were all found relative to the distance between the Earth and the Sun, the astronomical unit, often abbreviated as AU. Kepler refined these measurements to take into account the elliptical orbits. However, they did not know how large an astronomical unit was. Finding the actual distance of the AU then sets the scale of the solar system. But not only does it set the scale of the solar system, it is the baseline for determining the distances to the stars using parallax, and those parallax distances set the scale for distances to other galaxies. So the AU turns out to be the fundamental distance unit for the universe, which is why so much effort was spent determining its value. It really is the astronomical unit. The picture shows how we determine the astronomical unit. Since we can't measure the distance to the sun directly, we use a planet distance we can measure and then derive the sun's distance through trigonometry. Again, concentrate on the astronomy measurement part. We need a planet's distance and its angular separation from the Sun to derive the long side of the triangle. Before we move on to other planet properties, recall how orbits work through Kepler's third law. The orbit size tells you how long it takes anything to orbit the Sun. Period, or time, square, equals distance cubed. 
So with some algebra, period equals distance to the three halves, or 1.5 power. It is not period equals distance. For example, on your calculator or your phone calculator app, to find how long it takes Jupiter, which is 5.2 AU from the Sun to orbit the Sun, you'd punch in 5.2, hit the X to the Y key, then 1.5, then equals to find 11.86 years. For moons orbiting planets or satellites orbiting moons, the distance and time units would be different, but the relationship between distance and period would still be the same period squared and distance cubed. Kepler's third law works everywhere. The particular numbers are different, but the relationship between the distance and the period are the same. Recall from the history and gravity chapters that in Kepler's third law, the numerical value of the period gets larger more quickly than the numerical value of the distance. For example, an orbit twice as big as another will have an orbital period, or time, more than twice as long. That's because not only is the orbit's circumference twice as large, the orbit speed for the larger orbit is slower than for the smaller orbit. If you use the inverse square law of gravity, you find that the twice as big orbit has an orbit speed just 71% as fast as the smaller orbit. The relationship of period squared versus distance cubed in Kepler's third law is the result of the inverse square law nature of gravity. Once we have found the scale of the solar system, we could find out how long it would take us to travel around in the solar system. I show how we travel from Earth to Mars in the gravity chapter of the textbook, so let's take a look at another example, Venus. Because Unlike the fantasy of movies, we don't have an infinite amount of fuel, so we put the spacecraft in orbit around the sun, and the spacecraft uses the sun's gravity to coast to its destination. The orbit it will take is called a Hohmann orbit, after Walter Hohmann, who developed the theory for spacecraft paths on which NASA, ESA, and other space agencies still base their spacecraft missions today. This particular orbit requires the least amount of fuel and lets the sun's gravity take care of directing the spacecraft to its destination. The spacecraft requires only a single rocket firing from Earth orbit and then another rocket firing at the end of its trip to put it in orbit around the other planet. If we wait for just the right positioning of the Earth at launch and the planet at arrival, the planet will reach the de designated orbit position at the same time the spacecraft does. To go to Venus, the spacecraft has to fire its rockets in a direction opposite the Earth's orbital motion to get it to fall closer to the Sun. It will also need to fire the rockets as a brake to slow it down when it reaches Venus, so it can orbit or land on Venus. So let's figure it out now. Remember for Kepler's third law for orbiting the Sun, the period in years equals the semi-major axis in AU to the three-halves power. The major axis of the spacecraft orbit equals the perihelion plus the aphelion, which is Venus's distance from the Sun, 0.72 AU, plus Earth's distance from the Sun, 1.0 AU, equals 1.72 AU. The semi-major axis equals half the major axis, equals 0.86 AU. Plug that into Kepler's third law, period equals 0.86 to the 3 halves power equals 0.79753 equals 0.8 years rounded off. That's for the entire orbit, from Earth to Venus and back to Earth. We just want half the orbit, Earth to Venus. So divide 0.80 by 2 to get 0.40 years. There are 12 months in a year, so 0.4 times 12 equals 4.8 months.